Kareem. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live here. Got a very interesting broadcast for you this evening, a prophetic broadcast. In fact, Obama's strategic move to fulfill prophecy or biblical prophecy in this case here. Uh, definitely a prophetic segment of our, of our broadcast this evening. And uh, we are looking at some of the things that are going on that's just been reported in the news here. Ash Carter making an announcement about putting boots on the ground in Iraq to take back Mosul. Uh, this has been a very volatile situation here, and so I want to take you directly to the biblical prophecy uh, that we actually spoke about earlier this week uh, that is clearly, without question, uh, the prophecy that is nearing to be fulfilled here. We're speaking of none other than Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, there's other prophecies about Nineveh becoming a desolation, but this one is very provocative when it says he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like the wilderness. Uh, very serious situation to say the least there. Nineveh, by the way, is right there on the river where Mosul is in northwest uh, Iraq there. It is, according to even as the scripture says, part of Assyria. Assyria, by the way, uh, in biblical times covered what we call modern day Syria and also uh, western Iraq, uh, including north and south parts of Iraq there. So we are definitely looking at biblical prophecy that is about to be fulfilled. Now, some people even uh, may question, well, is this the biblical city of Nineveh that Jonah went to? I do believe that that is correct. I have here in the bottom a little small print there, Jonah chapter 3, verse 3. Remember, Jonah got on a ship and went to, to uh, was going to go to Tarshish instead of Nineveh, but he did it at Joppa, the, the, the seaport of Israel there. Uh, we don't know exactly where the ship went uh, out into the Mediterranean there when it finally got into a serious uh, situation there. But uh, we know that uh, Jonah was thrown overboard to spare the people of the ship there in the, uh, to, to calm the sea. We also know that uh, when God threw Jonah over, a special fish that was prepared swallowed him uh, and spit him out on a shoreline somewhere along the coast there in the Mediterranean. Now, some people argue that Nineveh then was actually there, a coastal city. But according to Jonah 3.3, 3, it says, He arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. So it was a three-day journey from that particular coastal area where he was spit out at. So, and if you look at the map, now, to me, it looks like it'd be a little bit more than three days by a foot, maybe four days, but uh, who knows how far that Jonah could have walked back then. But nonetheless, uh, he does go to this city, and I kind of believe that Nineveh that is being spoke of here in northwest Iraq is, in fact, that very Nineveh city there uh, that is spoken of here in the Bible. Anyway... Let's go into the prophetic side of this of what's happening here. Uh, RT News is reporting these, this story here today. Of course, there's other news sources as well on this. I just happened to catch it on RT News. It said, no boots on the ground. Pentagon plans to help retake ISIS, hotbeds, Raqqa, and Mosul. Uh, which is just kind of ironic. Uh, this is the very place where Iraq said for Turkey to get out. They got their troops on the ground. And as far as I know, Turkey still has not left Nineveh and Mosul. And if you're looking on a map there in, uh, over the, uh, this particular area here, there is a river that runs right down between the city. They're basically one big giant city there. Mosul is. Nineveh is on one side of the river and, of course, Mosul on the other side of the river. Uh, but according to this article here that came out on the 14th today, 2016, uh, which is the 15th now for me, but anyway, U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter has said the Pentagon plans to defeat Islamic State militants by helping local forces to retake Mosul and Raqqa. The Pentagon chief also said a commando task force is already on the ground in Iraq. Carter was speaking at a Fort Campbell on Wednesday to soldiers of the 101st Airborne D uh, Division and 2nd Brigade Combat Team, which will deploy to Iraq. He said that Islamic State would face the long arm of the hard fist of justice there. 
Uh, they got quite a bit of soldiers there, uh, believe it or not. They already had over 3,000 American troops in Iraq to start with, but deploying uh, quite a large number of more troops. I believe this particular group that he's speaking of here is more than 1,000 of the, of the airborne wing that are going in there. Uh, so definitely our troops on the ground. That's one of the reasons why RT News makes the comment uh, that there, uh, you know, no more troops on the ground because they keep remembering what the State Department has said. Barack Obama has stated clearly that there would be no more troops, boots on the ground in Iraq. And yet, it's just the opposite is taking place. Anyway, it says in Iraq, uh, continuing in the same article in Syria, Carter added the coalition will try to cut off key transit routes to Raqqa and Mosul. Uh, thus preventing Islamic State from moving militants to and from those locations, according to the Pentagon press release. The bottom line of the plan is to help the Iraqi army and Kurdish uh, Peshmerga forces retake Mosul in northern Iraq, while assisting moderate Syrian forces in ousting ISIS militants from the Syria, Syrian town of uh, Raqqa. Yeah. What doesn't make sense is why didn't the United States get involved with Mosul back before Iraq couldn't, couldn't stop them from ISIS from coming in there and taking everything. The United States lost a tremendous amount of hardware to ISIS. And you cannot help but wonder if they wanted to lose those, uh, that equipment there because still the United States wants to see Bashar al-Assad toppled. And the only way to topple Bashar al-Assad is with the help of ISIS, which the United States is armed. And of course now have, they have indirectly armed. Now the U.S. has got to take and show good face. They got to go in there and do some fighting. But remember, everything in the Middle East here is about the oil to begin with. So let's don't forget that. Anyway, the Nineveh Council, there was no withdrawal or enforcement of Turkish troops in Iraq, according to almonitor.com. As I said, Iraq supposedly, or excuse me, Turkey was supposedly going to withdraw their forces. The Iraqis have leaned on Russia a little bit when this was all going on. Russia's really watching closely, but suddenly America is coming into the play now. So not only has Turkey kept their troops in Iraq's territory up there around Mosul and Nineveh, uh, we also see, according to the almonitor.com, they've not moved anything. It says here, surrounded by unfriendly neighbors as a result of serious policy blunders, Turkey now finds itself facing a fresh crisis with Iraq, with which, with which it has less than warm relations in recent years. The cause of the latest uh, fracas is the December 3rd deployment of 150 Turkish troops and 25 tanks to uh, Bashika, a town north of Mosul. That, Turkey er, uh, argues, are for training Kurdish uh, Peshmerga and Arab fighters to con uh, confront the Islamic State. The move has resulted in much speculation about Ankara's true motives. Russia, with the support from Baghdad, wasted little time capitalizing on the fresh crisis, calling for Turkish military actions in Syria and Iraq to be discussed at the UN Security Council. Moscow's announcements followed Iraq's threat to take the matter to the Security Council if the Turkish troops were not withdrawn in 48 hours. Well, President Putin, uh, your threat didn't do a whole lot of good. Quite obvious there. Uh, moving on, though, let's take a look here. The Specialized, this is still going back to Ash Carter, what he's doing, the Specialized Expeditionary Target Force, uh, announced in December, is now in place and preparing to work with Iraqis to begin going after ISIL fighters and commanders, killing or capturing them wherever we can find them, along with other key targets, Carter said. But you got to remember, as I keep saying, the whole thing over here is nothing but about the oil. Even with President Putin, it's about the oil. And doing more research, not only are we seeing prophecy about to fulfill itself, because this oil-rich region is being fought over like nuts in this area. Uh, so let me, I want to take the time here really to slow down and let's really look at what's going on. As I've already stated to you, the prophecy that we just read moments ago there uh, is that, let me just back up to it real quick. We'll come back here to, to, to the screen here in one second here, but this is really important. We relook at the scripture, Zephaniah 2.13, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. 
that's basically the whole region, Syria and everything, being destroyed. And I will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like the wilderness. All right, so we are truly seeing prophecy, friends, being fulfilled. And with these different nations there in the Middle East, it's bringing the entire Syrian country down to rubble. It, Nineveh, without question, is going to become totally uninhabited very soon. You've already got Russia willing to back uh, Baghdad, Iraq there. Uh, the United States though, still has forces in Iraq, which is making it uneasy for the Russians because Russia has come down to protect their own interests there in Syria, uh, which you're going to see here in just a few minutes. So somewhere along the way, there's going to be a major contention, and this could be the boiling point. Nineveh could be the hotbed that really causes everything to boil over there in the Middle East, uh, to say the very least there. Let me share with you an article, though, in the New Arab uh, uh, online uh, news source here. This was back in, um, uh, on September the 22nd of 2015. Now keep that date in mind, because if you remember, Russia started their military campaign on September the 30th, only eight days later after this, uh, this article here was published. It says, Russian oil and gas company, Soyuz Neftagaz, has begun oil uh, prospecting operations in Lat uh, Latkia on the western coast of Syria, a source has told Al Arabi Al Jadid's Arabic service. Now you got to keep in mind that particular oil and gas company is state owned by Russia. The unnamed source said prospecting for oil has begun in Latkia's uh, Quinanis district after the Syrian minister of petroleum, Suleiman al-Abbas, recently met with, with his Russian counterpart in Damascus. Again, reminded back in September 22nd. This will have a major role in future investment opportunities in the land offshore oil prospecting and drilling as well as setting up joint ventures in oil and gas services, the source reported the minister is saying in the hushed meeting. The source added that Abbas had said the start of oil drilling continued uh, the fruitful cooperation between Russia and Syria and that it served the best interests of both countries. Friends, this is why Russia is there. It's not that Russia is just there for good humanitarian means. Russia is there because, too, as President Putin has said, when it comes to the United States and what they're doing in the Middle East, they need to also consider Russia's natural, national interest as well. But, of course, the United States is not interested in Russia's national interest. They're only interested in their national interest. That's the United States. There is no sharing involved here when it comes to the United States. And that's been made very clear by the aggressive posture of NATO and their own allies. And Russia, of course, uh, with fewer allies, but they do have China, Iran in the picture here as well. But again, all these countries are there for the oil. And it is becoming more and more obvious the more we dig and find these things. So Russia does launch their airstrikes in Syria. And of course, CNN had reported on October 1st, 2015, uh, uh, Ed Payne had brought this out. And uh, uh, Barbara Starr and Susan uh, Cullen, uh, th this was all brought out there about the Russian bombings there, but actually began on September the 30th. So we are definitely seeing prophecy in the making and in order for them to get all this region it is war it is to disrupt the lives of the people in Syria and Nineveh basically Assyria which is the whole region there part of Iraq part of Syria and of course don't forget President Putin signed a deal with Mahmoud Abbas too in the West Bank for the rights off of uh, the coast of Gaza as well as those uh, oil finds inside of the country there of the West Bank. So Russia is going to protect their interests everywhere. This is one reason why I think we're seeing too that the Israeli Prime Minister more and more sides with the United States distancing himself from Russia and also accusing Russia of all kinds of uh, uh, atrocities that are going on in Syria. Children being killed in a school recently there in a bomb that went wayward for Russia. Now again, 
We can't separate from propaganda because we don't know we're not there. So we don't know which one is telling the truth, which one is not telling the truth. But nonetheless, both Russia and the United States very much, and the other nations, Germany, France, everybody that's involved in NATO, all have an interest in this. But then again, what do we have here? Putin claims ISIS receives financing from 40 countries at G20 summit following Paris attacks. I wanted to bring this up because it was another prophecy that we mentioned to you a little while back here as well, and that was from Hosea. Hosea chapter 12, which we'll go into in just a moment here, speaks about the oil being taken from Assyria and sent into Egypt. And I said to you guys, there's got to be a link somewhere. It's not just Turkey that's involved. There's got to be an Egyptian connection somewhere here because we saw the prophecies here and we knew that it had to be there. Well, let me share with you what Putin says here. President Putin, this is on International Business Times, uh, printed out here on November the 16th, 2015, says here, President Vladimir Putin shared intelligence that he said showed the Islamic State group is financed by 40 countries. He is pictured November 6th at the Kremlin. Russia's President Vladimir Putin made claims Monday that the Islamic State group has received financial support from more than 40 countries, including some in attendance at the G20 summit, uh, in Turkey. Putin told Roy, uh, reporters that he shared evidence with other G20 member states at the meeting. It was reported by Russia Today. I provided examples based on our data on the financing of different Islamic states, units by private individuals. This money, as we have established, comes from 40 countries, and there are some of the G20 members among them, Putin told journalists. It has been reported that there are donors in Kuwait, Qatar, Saudi Arabia that support ISIS, but Putin did not specify the countries he was referring to when speaking with reporters. Notice, though, Kuwait. Now, before we go into more about this, let me first give you that pro prophecy that we're looking at here in chapter 12 of Hosea. It says, Ephraim, and then, by the way, for those of you that are reading from a King James Bible there, this begins in uh, chapter 11, verse 12, and then into verse 1 of uh, chapter 12 of Hosea. But in the Mamre Online Bible, it's Hosea chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Anyway, it says, Ephraim compasseth me about with lies. By the way, Ephraim here is not Great Britain. This is the United States, but in reality, they are one and the same. Many people believe that Great Britain is Ephraim and the United States is Manasseh. But I don't have time in this particular broadcast to go into that. But God has clearly showed that Ephraim is the United States. Look at what he says here. Ephraim compasseth me about with lies in the house of Israel with deceit. And Judah is yet wayward towards God. That's interesting. Now, according to the King James, they didn't quite translate that very well right there. The word is wayward in, in Hebrew. It's not the way, uh, I forget how King James translates it, but it really kind of messes up the, the, the meaning. Judah is yet wayward towards God and towards the Holy One who is faithful. The Holy One is none other than the Messiah, Yeshua himself. But it's interesting because it gives us a timeline. Judah is yet wayward. The house of Judah is who's back in the homeland of Israel today. This is the house of Judah that is there, waiting for the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 12 to be fulfilled when they will uh, see the one that they have pierced and they will mourn for him as a family that lost their only son. Okay, so that's yet to be fulfilled. So Judah is yet wayward. In other words, they still don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. And uh, 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 towards God and towards the Holy One, which is the Messiah, Mashiach, who is going to be cut off before the destruction of the second temple, a temple according to Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9. Notice verse 2, or verse 1, chapter 12, for those in King James Ephraim striveth, striveth after wind and followeth after the east wind. Because he comes from the west, the United States, going after the east wind into the Middle East, that is. All the day he multiplieth lies and desolations. Or desolation. What is he doing? He has been in there for, for years now. First with the war against Iraq under the Bush administration with a, just a destruction of that country, and then they come in, and notice it says, He multiplieth lies. 
There has been more lies told on Bashar al-Assad that he never did, such as the gassing with sarin gas of his own people, which we found out recently, proven by Turkish insiders there, people in the Turkish country there, have proven that it was actually Turkey themselves that provided the sarin gas that was mixed by ISIS, and ISIS did it, in order to blame the Assad regime, only to be able to disarm Bashar al-Assad, putting pressure on the government there. So yes, Ephraim is uh, constantly is nothing but a liar. And yet at the same time to do what? To make desolation. So he's been bent after lying all about uh, 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 Saddam Hussein and whether or not he had uh, weapons of mass destructions. Ephraim lied about that and went in there and overtook the country. For what? For the oil. Now he's over there in the middle of Syria and been lying about Bashar al-Assad, making him look like the biggest heathen on the planet Earth. Only we're finding out as things are leaking out that Bashar al-Assad is not as wicked as he says, but or, or as, as the West has claimed, but we're finding out that the wicked one is actually the liar, and that's the Obama administration who has been blaming him, and of course the Bush administration just as guilty as Obama. Obama's no worse than what Bush was in that regard. And of course both men are making the countries totally desolate. Anyhow, it says here, and they make a covenant with Assyria, and oil is carried into Egypt. Well, for a long time, I could not find that quite connection there. But here's what's interesting, and they make a covenant with Assyria. You know, there has been articles I've already found already that is where it says the West turned their back, and so did Great Britain, turned a blind eye while the illegal oil smuggling was done by ISIS being sold, of course, Russia says, to Turkey. But we find out, just follow the money, and you'll find out the United States was helping even Assad to get that, or whether or not he's doing it with Assad or with the ISIS militants, Remember, Micah 7 says that they make the country desolate by their own people. Micah chapter 7, verse 13. We brought this out just in the broadcast the other day, there, day before yesterday. Go back and check that out. Said I can't pop it up on the screen for you right now. But Micah chapter 7, verse 13. Syria becomes desolate because of the people within, and that's exactly what the United States has done. They have gone in there, multiplied lies against Assad, armed uh, so-called moderate rebels, as well as ISIS, and they have totally made the country a desolation, practically, at this point here. And at the same time, they're making a deal with those people there to get oil carried into Egypt. Let's take a look and see how the rabbit trail plays out. This here is on called the Daily News Egypt uh, News Report here. Egypt to import 3 million barrels of crude oil per month from Kuwait. Contract to end in September. Uh, facility will be allowed to full payment within 30 days for extra million barrels, says official. Kuwait Petroleum Corporation will supply Egypt with about 3 million barrels of crude oil per month, as well as solar and jet fuel supplies worth $1.2 billion annually. A high-profile official of petroleum sector told Daily News Egypt that Kuwait supplies Egypt with 2 million barrels of crude oil per month, with full payment to, to occur within a within a nine-month period. Now, it's a big circle here. The Syrian Bashar al-Assad was buying the oil from Egypt, and Kuwait was supplying the oil to the Egyptians. But if you remember, just a moment ago, we spoke about who's the supporter of ISIS. Russia uncovered that some of the big supporters come from Kuwait. Well, you know, Kuwait, they're not just going to give away all this money to support ISIS. You got to pay us back somehow, buddy. Well, we speculate that that payment back may be in the form of oil. Very easy to get it and get it over to the Kuwaitis. And of course, the Kuwaitis can turn around, sell it to the Egyptians, and then of course, Bashar al Assad buys it back from the Egyptians again. That's not the only source that we ran across on this. Let me show you a little bit more here. Reuters, exclusive Assad secret oil lifeline, Iraqi crude uh, from Egypt. Syrian government, President Bashar al-Assad, has received substantial imports of Iraqi crude oil from an Egyptian port in the last nine months. Shipping and payments documents show part of an under-the-radar uh, under trade that has kept his military running despite Western sanctions. 
That's not all. Let's take a look at another one here. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's getting into something else altogether. Sorry about that. Uh, you have to keep in mind, ISIS already has control of the oil fields in Syria and Iraq. And I, I did forget to put one part of this article on here. But the point is, Kuwait is supplying the oil directly to Egypt. Egypt is supplying it, turn around, sending it right back to Assad. And at the same time, Kuwait is sponsoring the ISIS terrorists. So as we said, it's a speculation, but the Bible clearly says that there is a deal made with Assyria, and that oil is sent to Egypt. I still think there's more links somewhere. But you know, they're doing a very good job of keeping that covered up as much as possible. In other news here, one more thing we want to share with you guys tonight, and this is a shocker, uh, to say the least there. This is something that it slipped past us. We did not catch this back in July when this article came out, but I, I wanted to bring this to your attention. It is very serious, especially in light of a report we brought to you recently about uh, uh, Charisma Magazine, speaking about how the, the, in Mexico they were doing forced conversions uh, to the Catholic uh, belief system, and if they did not uh, convert to the Catholicism, they were being put in prison. So far, so uh, seven had been put in prison, and many others had uh, converted under the duress. We had confirmation with a, a family that uh, is also a supporter of the ministry here, uh, listens to the broadcast regularly there, that contacted us from Mexico and advised us that what Charisma Magazine reported is only a small bit of what is really going on. I, I hope the brother will get back in touch with me again. I won't speak his name here on the air, uh, but we would like to know more about that situation there in uh, Mexico because why? Pope Francis is going to Mexico next month in February, but watch what happens here. Protestant leaders declare reunification of churches under the Holy See. Under the Holy See. You heard that right. The mother whore her daughters are coming home. This was published on July 9th of 2015 by Real News Right Now was the uh, source for this. Vatican City, following more than 500 years of separation, American and European Protestant leaders met with the Pope Francis last week to finalize reunification of the two churches under the Holy See. The historic agreement is the result of a year's worth of unpublicized talks between Protestant leaders and the Vatican. Prominent American pastor, pastors, Joel Osteen and Rick Warren. By the way, they're not part of the two denominations that join this, okay? Joel Osteen and Rick Warren, respectively, as well as Justin Wilby and the Archbishop of Canterbury, were among the Protestant delegation that met with Pope Francis last week. Pastor Warren, founder of Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, spoke with members of the international press in St. Peter's Square saying, Protestants as a people have a long history of heresy. Protestants as a people have a long history of heresy. It's turning the table around, isn't it? You know, it's easy for the Vatican to get one over you because she's got a, she had a church-state-sponsored Bible for you to begin with. Hmm. The time for reconciliation is now in order to ensure a full dogmatic transition into the folds of the church, the article states. You got a picture here, Pope Francis there, as someone had done this up, uh, they, they put Joel Osteen in the photograph here, we picked this up online, moments before meeting with reporters, the entire Protestant delegation for the first time ever entered the confessional to take part individually in the sacraments of penance. It's important that we participate in these sacred rituals before asking our congregations to do the same, Pastor Osteen said, adding that his time in confession was an immensely moving experience. They went into the little cubicles right there and asked the priest to forgive them for ever saying anything against the Catholic Church. You don't think we're going back to the Inquisition? 
You don't think what hap is happening in Mexico is, so, you know, some people wrote and said, that's just runaway, uh, uh, you know, heretical Catholic churches over there. You know, the brother that wrote me from Mexico said, no, they're not either. He said, the Vatican is very well aware of what's going on, and they do support it. And we see right here, the Vatican's been nice about it. Remember, Pope Francis, at the end of this month, they have the great big convention called the Year of Jubilee. The year of mercy, as he calls it. Remember the Pope said not long ago, your money is not going to save you. You've got a year to come. It's coming down, friends. You want to talk about the mark of the beast. This is where your mark is coming from. You're going to do what the Vatican says, or you're not going to buy or sell. As Protestants around the world make the transition to Catholicism, many are wondering what, wondering what exactly that means for them. First and foremost, we acknowledge the Pope's infallibility with regard to universal moral declaration, the authority of the church, magistrate, faith, and ex, uh, ex cathedra said Father Cliff Brogan, a former Protestant pastor who was the first of the delegation to be ordained as a priest at the Vatican. He's already converted. Th this is conversions, friends. These are Protestants that are all converting to Catholicism. Rick Warren is now a Catholic. Joel Osteen is now a Catholic. These churches have all come back under the Catholic banner. They're going to allow you to hang on to your name, but you're going to convert or else. As a part of the introduction of the Catholic faith, all Protestants above the age of 15 are required to undergo a Catholic confirmation, one of the three sacraments of initiation out of the seven total which Catholics can receive. Most, if not all of us, have been baptized, said Father Brogan. However, without formal confirmation, our Protestant baptisms will be null, thus preventing us from entering the kingdom of heaven. You don't think that these people don't, that they, that, I mean, they're, they're, they're totally taken in. There's no way to get to heaven except through the Catholic Church. Additionally, during the transition period, American Protestant families whose children attend Sunday school are to receive vouchers allowing them to participate in CCD programs at area Catholic churches. Oh my God, friends. In a show of support for the reunification under the Holy See, the United Kingdom announced Wednesday that it is taking steps to reunify Northern Ireland, Ireland, excuse me, Northern Ireland um, with the Republic of Ireland. The government on the UK has acknowledged that the stark differences between the two countries, but according to one official, we are for the first time one people united under the Bishop of Rome, acting together as the bride and servant of Christ. My God, we are talking about Antichrist movement like you've never seen before. At the same time, the march on the Middle East, prophecy about to fulfill, Syria being without inhabitant. Remember what it says in Daniel chapter 11, these lawless men come together with the Pope of Rome, that prince that shall come, and they try to marry the vision. They're trying to marry the, they're trying to marry the churches to uh, not to Christ, but to the Pope of Rome. You know, the next thing you're going to see is Damascus, the ruinous heap. It's not going to be a nuclear bomb, friends. It's happening right now before your eyes. Let me share with you some of the aerial footage here uh, that RT done here. This is just interesting here because we remember Isaiah 17, 1, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and shall be a ruinous heap. Notice this twofold prophecy. It's taking away from being a city. They're no longer a city. They've been, it's been taken, it's been robbed from the people of Syria. Now they're just a bunch of refugees leaving all over the world. And it becomes a ruinous heap. This is a this is a particular huge neighborhood area in Damascus here. And this whole neighborhood here that you're seeing on your screen is nothing but a pile of rubble. I understand now why the Bible says a ruinous heap, heaped up. Why? Because these buildings are huge. Once you bomb them all down, they're nothing but a pile of rubble. Nineveh soon to be in, uninhabited, desolate and a pile of rubble as well. And as well, Rome is taking control of the world. 
It's a late hour, friends. It's a very late hour. I want to thank you, and I want to thank you, those of you that have, been, that are, that have showed your support here, different parts of the world, contributing to this broadcast. We thank you. We do need your help, and i just say that briefly. We still need your help. Very serious things. We are doing a live broadcast at the end of this month. We will not be announcing beforehand what the broadcast is. It's a very special broadcast. You will appreciate it tremendously. Uh, we will be bringing it live, and this is one of the reasons why we do need your help there, but we cannot uh, announce it for... For, just for safety purposes, for our part, we need to be safe where we're going to, and uh, we're just dangerous parts of the world. In fact, also in February as well, uh, we will be uh, in, a, in another dangerous zone as well uh, that's very risky, and uh, so we just just letting you know we need your help, and we thank you for those of you that have been a part of this. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Shalom, God bless you, and I trust this program has been a blessing. Share it with as many people as you can because God continues to reveal more and more and more, and we want to bless people with everything that we can and keeping you up to date with the latest news, things that are going on, and how it relates to Bible prophecy. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Those that want to give, you can give. You'll see in just a moment here on the screen our websites, israelreturns.com and israelinewslive.org. You can go and give there online. There is an address that will appear at the end of the broadcast as well if you prefer to mail a donation that way. Thank you and God bless you.